so anyway here we are signed on a little early pretty sure oh this hour is at five so I'm just gonna sit here and do some work while we're waiting for people to sign on or whatever Um, so let's just do some work. Do, 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 do. This needs to move over to this side, and this needs to move over to this side, and then we'll just keep plugging away. Uh, this guy until people actually show up and we'll move this over here as well um, and move this over here as well
Hey, Mike. Well, where are my peeps? Um, hmm. Oh, five new messages. hours office hours there we go oh hey we got some people hi hey guys so, how's it going over there it is going just been working 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 so <laughs> what do we have it looks like we have terror i think that's mm and think miss us and i think that's marissa I, th I was texting Mike. I thought Mike was going to come in. Maybe he's just not here yet. 
I was chatting with him on the just the general channel. Yeah, I think last week Mike was saying that he was moving, so he wasn't on then. But Cole is going to be on. Cool, cool, cool. Let me cool stop that. Okay. Cool, man. So, who wants to start? Who's got an issue? I can go second. I think that whoever Terror is doesn't want to be screen recorded, so she's probably not going to talk much. Got it. Okay. Um, so, then I guess I'll jump into mine. Yeah, oh. that's fine. Um, so for San Bernardino County, serving the social workers in their individual capacity. Yeah. Do you have issues with that ever? Yeah. What's, what's going to end up happening is they're going to jack you around. What I usually end up doing with San Bernard, well, it depends on what attorneys represent them. If the, uh, if it's just county council, you can probably work something out where they'll accept service. If it's, um, what the hell's the name of that law firm, Collins Collins, then, you know, they're just going to dick you around. So you're going to need to actually search for the people, figure out where they live and go get personal service on them at their residence. That's what we usually do. If you end up getting uh, Doug Smith, his law office, they'll usually work something out with you to not necessarily accept service, but they'll get somebody at the county office who you can go, you know, who will accept service. So it just depends, you know, on, gotcha. on who, who you get on the other side out there. It's it's county council, but they're being very. Um, yeah, uh, I easy. would just I, I would just uh, do your own efforts to locate the personal residences of the social workers, and then I'd go nail them at home. Do it on a Sunday evening. <laughs> And there you go. Try to try to coordinate it so you can get them all in the same afternoon. That way they can't communicate with each other and start trying to dodge you or whatever other such well, nonsense. How, how simple is that process, though, when the U.S. Marshals are the ones who are supposed to issue out the summons? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> right. I no idea. I've, never, I've never been in that position before, so I have no clue. I couldn't tell you. Got it. Okay, just checking. I, I mean, I thought originally that, I mean, you just kind of like it is in L.A. County, you just go to the headquarters, you give it to them, they accept service. Um, so totally different process for San Bernardino. Every, every county is different. I have to admit, L.A. is actually pretty efficient about it. And, um, you know, they're, they're among the better, at least in terms of service. And like I said, with Riverside County, um, it depends on what attorney you get representing the defendant same with san bernardino san diego county you know sometimes it depends what attorney gets assigned to it they never go with private counsel it's always going to be um county counsel but it just depends on which specific attorney in the office gets assigned to it some are pretty cool we can work with them some are you know just assholes so it's you just got it. gotta play it by ear gotcha okay cool that answers my question for the week Cool. Who else do we have here? Um, uh, um, here. Can you hear me? Who is questioner? I'll just be questioner today. But for federal court, isn't there an alternative to service where you send them something and they have 60 days to respond that they... Yeah, you're talking about a, a notice and acknowledgement or an acknowledgement and waiver. And yeah, something like that. They, an acknowledgement and waiver is an agreement. First of all, it's an agreement to essentially accept service. And by agreeing, the benefit they get to agreeing is they get 60 days to answer instead of whatever, 21 or 30, whatever it is. So that's all that is. If you just send it to them and they don't sign it and send it back to you, you have no agreement. So then you have to go serve them. But then they have to pay for the service. Well, if they felt knows at you, they have to pay for service as opposed well, to if you. Yeah, you're going to have to go to the judge to enforce that and, you know, enjoy that. Okay. Oh, all right. I just thought that might be helpful. For yeah, they're not, they're not, they're not going to just say, oh, we, we refuse to do your acknowledgement and waiver. 
you went ahead and served us. Here's a check, you know, sorry. No, they, they don't do that. In fact, if you want to collect your money, you're going to have to file a motion. You're going to have to go to the court. They may drum up good cause. Who knows what's going to happen there? I've never actually had success collecting one of those. Oh. Yeah. It kind of sucks, but, you know, that's how it is. I mean, you know, it might be different for a pro per that maybe the courts would, you know, be more sympathetic and, you know, make them pay. But I've never seen it. to know but it is an option it's it's there and there's a form for it and we do use those sometimes like i was saying earlier um riverside with a doug smith the uh, doug smith's office they never use those but what he will do is he'll find somebody at the county who will show up you know basically by appointment and accept service on behalf of everybody and then you just you know go over there and serve that person um they do that down San Diego, they do use, again, depending on which attorney you get at the office, some are willing to go ahead and sign the notice and acknowledgement and waiver of service, and some aren't. And then up in LA, I've had some, you know, reasonably good luck with private counsel. Again, nobody at the Collins firm, but other firms. I've had pretty good luck with private counsel going ahead and doing the acknowledgement and waiver. And, and again, there's a benefit to the defendants to do that because they get a lot of extra time to respond to your complaint. It's not just any, you know, an answer. They can get more time to file their motion. So it does benefit the defendants to do the acknowledgement and waiver. So anybody else got anything? Tara, you got anything? Yeah, I got a lot of things. Okay, well, just recognize it's all being recorded and it's going to go up on YouTube. So if there's yeah. something that you want to keep private, don't say it here. Yes, thank you for that reminder. Okay, so you um, have a question? I have a question. I'm wondering if you have a deposition uh, either in your channel or elsewhere on a manager for the yeah. decision maker who decides to get the warrant even when there's no oh who decides to okay. to get the warrant mm -hmm. i don't know if i've got one of those I, I know that i've got up on the channel already and i i did see your stuff in discord and i've been talking to james about uh you know options what we can what we can put up that might be helpful for you but what's up there already is the directors or i guess they don't call them directors up in la they're the aras and the ras the regional administrator and the assistant regional administrator the musa yan balaban in the duval case she was an ara and I, i'm assuming that'd be equivalent to a director in your venue but she is an ara and we've got her deposition up i don't remember if we have the whole deposition up but we definitely have the pieces that were presented to the jury, the excerpts that were presented to the jury in lieu of live testimony. Those are up. And then oh, wow. What's the name again? There's Musa Yan Balaban. Musa Yan Balaban. Okay, I'll look for that on your channel. What else yeah. did you And say? then there's a, another one. Um, I think his name is Steven Sanders, and he was the RA. He's like the top dog. And mm -hmm. he is also up on the channel he and again i don't i don't think it was the whole deposition but mm -hmm. i think what's up there are the excerpts that were played to the jury in lieu of live testimony so those two are up there now and those mm -hmm. might be beneficial for you just you know sort of like the structure of the depo not necessarily the same questions because in remember in that case there was no warrant he sought or obtained in fact it was a unwarranted seizure so I mean, that's what we're going oh. after them for. So it's a little bit different situation than what you're looking at. If they got a warrant, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be a different different circumstance. Got a warrant, and so far we've gotten mm -hmm. acknowledgement that was there was no, no imminent Yeah. So imminent anyway, those are, the, those are the two that I would look at if mm -hmm. I were, really? you know, betting. That's 
Say, say that all again. You were we were talking over each other. It was someone who just came on? They muted. They were talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so anyway, that's that's what I would tell you for right now is just take a look at Muzayan Balaban and Stephen Sanders. I don't know that I have a whole bunch more you know, higher, like upper echelon management people. And I definitely don't have any upper management people under circumstances where they actually got a warrant. In fact, that was one of the big problems out here in California back in from like 2000, probably 2000 until 2014 is none of them were getting warrants. They just go in and willy nilly seize kids. And that was good enough. And you know, then we started litigating those things and it took them about 10 years before they figured out that, oh, we can shut you down if we just get warrants. And then they started getting warrants. But anyway, yeah, that's all I've got for you on that. What about not high management, not, not the upper management? How about the lower? Yeah, uh, the, the, the lower the lower people, I mean, those are all on the channel already. You're, we've been posting those. That's what the lives are, is the lower level, the line workers and their supervisors. But again, those are all cases where there was no warrant obtained. Right. If you have right. a warrant, no, okay. if you have a situation where they got a warrant, your only real avenue of attack there is a judicial deception claim. And those are all up there too. Any Any deposition where you hear me asking them, you know, you have an affirmative obligation to be truthful, honest, accurate, and complete. That's a that's a classic judicial deception claim. So any one of those depots would be a reasonably good template. Uh, do you remember any like names of cases where they got a warrant, but it was obtained by not being um, not not answer? really not really because that's I mean that's not usually how we get involved in it. If they got a warrant, in fact, generally, unless it's really blatant, I won't accept the case, at least not for a warrantless uh, seizure or a judicial deception in the warrant type case. Um, I think what you're going to want to do, though, is the same rules that apply to a warrant are going to be the rules that apply to a detention report, a jurisdictional report, any court report where it's being offered in, you know, to evidence and the social worker knows they're lying. So you just take the same, you know, and there's plenty of depots. Even Duval has a bunch of depots up there that we played to the jury on the deception issue because they were lying in their detention report. You take those same outlines and they will apply to a warrant, a detention report, a jurisdictional okay. report, anything filed with the court, any sworn statement filed with the court. The same basic approach will apply. Do you know which one in the Duval case? All of the Duval okay. case. Uh, the Susan Pender, the Rogers, she, okay. what was her name, Sheely. Um, okay. Any of the Duval depots. There were two things going on in the Duval case. One was the unwarranted seizure, and the other was lies throughout the case. So any, oh. of, any of the depositions there will be useful for you. Have any cases where they took a child because the parent didn't cooperate uh, for that reason alone? Generally, that's all of our cases. The parents don't cooperate. It pisses off a worker, so they take the kid. In any case you see on my site is a situation where the parent didn't cooperate. That's, that's typically how these things happen is social services will get involved the parent doesn't fully cooperate or at least doesn't cooperate, you know, to the extent the social worker wants them to. You know, you didn't get down on the floor and kowtow immediately. So the social worker, they'll escalate. They're like cops, but, you know, they don't have any way to escalate other than take your kid. So that's basically it. Let me move on just for a moment. I, I see that Mike and so May are also here with us. We're somewhat time limited today, so... You know, we'll we'll bounce around here. Alyssa, you were on first. You have anything else uh, say there? Besides, hey, hello, no, hi there. I've been gone for a few days. <clears throat> um, uh oh, I'm not hearing you very well. Sounds like you're trying to talk through a tunnel or something. Oh no, that's weird. 
here. Go ahead, Mike. You can go ahead first, and then I'll figure out my sound here. Okay, cool. Hey, Mike. How's it going, man? Hey, Sean. How are you guys doing? Been uh, away for a few weeks. Uh, I was moving, so I was uh, preoccupied, but good to be back. Yeah, I, re I remember that. That's what uh, Marissa said, said you're out moving. Yeah, um, I have an off-the-topic uh, question. Sure. Um, I, I filed that complaint with the uh, Bar Association about the uh, uh, minor council interfering with the reunification uh, with the mother. And uh -huh. I got a response back that said um, due to minor and uh, minor council uh, client uh, confidentiality privilege, they weren't able to... Um, proceed further with with the F, uh, investigation but the investigation had nothing to do with um the minor it was uh totally with the uh minor council overstepping uh i think their boundaries when it comes to um uh, interfering with the reunification during the reunification process with the um you know, mother. I mean, I could read it to you, um, but it, it, well, it, well, hold on a second. Did you go back to the the whoever's investigating that at the bar and essentially tell them that? Say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with what happened between the minor and their attorney. This has to do with what happened between their attorney and mom. Did you explain that to them? Uh, no, because I'm doing. I'm the pretty much the third party uh, doing all the legwork for mom. Oh, but I was I got you. So you don't even have standing to do do that and, and say, hey, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Why would there be a you know conflict with um, you know minor? Because nothing has to do with minor. It just has to do with uh, minor counsel interfering with the re reunification, regardless if. Did you guys bring that up? Did you bring that up with the juvenile court while it was ongoing? You, you know, uh, at the time I couldn't because there was an active uh, restraining order, and it would have gave uh, wow. clear evidence that I was in contact with mother, which was you know not supposed to be. Um, yeah. So, I, and mom, you know, told her lawyer, but they didn't do anything. Yeah, got it, got it. So I, I had to just kind of step off of that well that kind of sucks yeah well i'm not sure exactly what to do on the state bar guys i mean if they don't want to they probably just don't want to investigate it you know because it's coming gonna lead to something well it's coming out of a juvenile dependency case and you know everybody coming out of a juvenile dependency case whether they prevailed or or not is unhappy and disgruntled so they're probably just taking a, you know, approach to it like, hey, you know, this is this is, uh, you know, just a disgruntled parent or something, which is, I mean, that's obviously not the correct, you know, assumption. Assumption, but that's the harsh reality is that's that's what you're facing. Yeah, this is what they said. Just in a nutshell, says we are closing your complaint due to the attorney-client privilege between Miss Ramirez. And your child, as your child's attorney, it is Miss Romero's duty to take action to protect her client's interests, even if such actions are detrimental to the interests of other parties, including those of your own. And again, they're talking to the mom at this point. Yeah. The attorney-client attorney privilege between Romero's and your child protects any information exchanged between Romero's and your child. Nobody was. Yeah, uh, nobody's, yeah, nobody's complaining about information that exchanged between sharing. Romero's and the child. You're complaining about what Ramirez did to interfere with reunification services. I totally get it. So, so I, I, wanna, I mean, I'm going to have mom go ahead and... Uh, I would go ahead and respond to it. it. Yeah, and have them do the complaint review unit to uh, have the third party uh, re-look into it and if need to reopen the case. But I just, I just want to make sure I wasn't missing any legal, you know, process that interferes with that but again i don't want it i'm not asking or or requesting anything that has to do with minor or minor counsel it's caregiver and minor counsel which to be honest that's a conflict of interest for her to even uh involve herself because that'd be a conflict of interest to uh, you know pick any one side whether it be mom or caregiver she's supposed to be representing the minor and not interfering uh 
yeah, you know, the with the process of reunification with mom and caregiver. That has nothing to do with her scope of, you know, duties, I believe. Yeah, I think you're probably I think you're probably right, but um, from a legal perspective, I'm not sure. I mean, what other remedy would there be besides a bar complaint or bringing it to the attention of the court in the juvenile dependency proceeding and then going from there? In fact, I think probably that's where you have to do it in the first instance is if there's an issue going on with interference with court-ordered reunification services, then that's got to be brought to the attention of the court. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised her, um, yeah, her, know, her own lawyer, attorney, Yeah, that. her own attorney probably, you know, drop the ball on that is what it sounds like. You know, in, in Contra Costa, you know, it's a give and take relationship because they see these guys all the time with the hundreds yeah. of cases. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's like a barter thing. They're like, you know what, I'll kind of squash this if you, you know, do this for me on this case. And that's what I, you know, makes me sick. Yeah, that, that kind of shit uh, for sure happens. Yeah, all day long. I, I watched it right in front of my eyes. Yeah, I, I know that 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 happens it's it's kind it's, of fucked it's, up that's why you know i encourage everybody to get private counsel if they can at least if, if you're paying the attorney they're probably not going to be fucking you over right or trying to make no future uh deal yeah, some side deal or, hey. yeah all right cool man well i'll, I'll go ahead and, and have mom escalated what it just sounds like they might have just wanted yeah, to close <laughs> What it sounds like to me is they're just trying to blow you off. Right. Because they explained what, what, they summarized why I sent the complaint down, you know, to a T, and then come back with that bullshit. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. They just, they're just blowing you off. That's what's going on there. They don't want to deal with it. I probably think I'm just going to, again, take it and, you know, bend over and take it. But they don't, they mess with the wrong father again. They're going to learn today. Yeah. Well, you just keep going at them, man. That's. Just, that's how you got to do it. Just be relentless. Uh, as I am. So, yeah, I'll, I'll let her know. Yeah, I hey, just want hey, to run that. I, I wanted to ask you. I haven't talked to you for a long time. What's going on with your complaint and, uh, you know, your methodology, the chat GPT and all that? How's that coming? Well, everything's been on pause the last two weeks as I've been uh, oh, you're moving. moving. Uh, so that's kind of been on pause. I mean, I'm three quarters of the way done. I just got to... Um, Make sure my timeline is in there. Uh, put in a couple of more um, uh, factual references, and then I talked to Marissa, and she said that you went over some good information. What to you know, trim the fat, so to speak, on what's you know relevant and what's not, as far as the general basis, um, as you put your summary together. So I still need to watch that video. Of, I believe it was last week. Oh, okay. Um, so I can fine tune mine, but uh, I'll have something definitely solid to, uh, you know, submit uh, to the uh, courts. And then, you know, if you wanted to kind of review, you know, what I put together and see if it has something that might hold water. Yeah, well, I, I, I want to review it. I don't know that I can give you legal advice or anything like that on it, but I'm interested to review it to see, you know, kind of how your process worked. Definitely, so if, definitely. If, you know, if you can get that dialed in and it works, that's a huge help to a lot of people that can't find attorneys. Definitely, especially if they, uh, well, if they get the template, that's pretty much, that was half my uh, battle. Yeah, half the struggle, was getting yeah. the format uh, from you. So, I mean, honestly, I probably would have had to revamp the whole thing if I didn't have, well, actually, as I, um, you know, tailor my requests from the AI um, you know it's if I do a couple of regenerations it uh, spits back some pretty uh, legit formats um, like I'm going to yes, sue so my, uh, the previous caregiver for defamation uh -huh. um, just because I you know know how the process works now I mean again if it's nothing but making them have to go through the process with me you know I'd rather, you know, take your time than your money because some of that ain't, uh, you're not going to get back. So, right, right. you know, they were careless with their, uh, you know, information to the court. Well, now you're going to have to pay those dues. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like that attitude. That's what I do with my traffic tickets, too, is I figure I'm doing a public service by taking every single one of them to trial. 
is you know you pull a cop off the street they got to sit there in court for several hours listen to all the bullshit you know you might think twice doing that in the future nothing else it still takes them out of circulation you know i look at it as a public service if nothing else yeah uh, you just gotta you gotta be accountable you know if you you know yeah i'm I'm all that's truth you're gonna have to hold it all the way through regardless of what blowback or repercussions you might face because of it yeah yeah absolutely so you got anything else or we'll uh move to no that was it i was just gonna play catch up this week kind of listen in uh get back in the uh groove of things here and uh get back on the uh track here nice nice sounds good well good to have you back good to be back so Alyssa, what you got you get your sound worked out uh oh. Maybe she's gone. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. you Is that you're, better? You're not really. You're still pretty far away. Just talk louder. Okay. So I'm just currently waiting now, waiting for the judge to, <clears throat> I guess, decide my fate. Oh, okay. Um, I did request oral argument. Um, mm-hmm. Is that going? How does that process work? Well, basically, what's going to happen if they give you oral argument? is you're going to go into court and then the judge will probably have questions for you or may explain to you, you know, whatever decision they're making may explain to you, you know, how they got there and then allow you an opportunity to present an argument or maybe some case law or, you know, whatever you've got to try to convince the judge that they're going the wrong way. So essentially what you're going to have to do is kind of read the tea leaves, figure out, okay, where is there likely to be a problem? And now I'm talking about how to prepare for that oral argument if you get it. Where is there likely to be a problem? What do I think that problem is going to be? And then you're going to need to find some cases that, you know, where that issue, whatever it is, resolves in your favor. And then that's what you're going to go argue. Um, It's hard to do that unless you really you know, have the briefing and, you know, know, know where the pitfalls are likely to be. And I, I mean, I haven't seen your briefing. I haven't seen any of that stuff. So okay. I don't really know. It's, you know, it, what it's the problem. statute of limitations. It, I'm, oh, yeah, it's, I'm pretty good. much, that's good. I'm hanging on by a thread. I'm, I have so much anxiety right now. I don't know what, which way it's going to go. Um, but I, I guess we're here. And yeah. I shouldn't have waited so long. I, I wish that I had all the information that I needed prior, and they unfortunately they weren't giving it to me. And what what can you do if you don't have the information you need? You can't file a lawsuit. Yeah, if you don't have it, so. you can't do it. That's for sure. But um, I just have one more quick question. Sure. Um, when I um, sent notice to the uh, caregiver about the defamation order, it says that I can ask her to settle up, uh, you know, restitution. Um, outside of having me file in the court, is is that like borderline blackmail? Um, what when you say it, it says that you can do that. What is the it you're referring to? All of the uh, information that I find online, both uh, AI and just you know Google search, that it allows for an opportunity for them to, you know, basically like settle out of court. You yeah. know, yeah, you're basically sending a demand. And it, it's not really, I mean, it's it sounds like blackmail. You're basically saying, pay me money or I'm going to sue you, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but there's nothing unlawful about doing that so long as you have a lawful basis for the lawsuit, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, I'm a sender what I'm going to file, you know, whether she yeah. you know, believes it or not. I mean, this is what I'm prepared to submit to the court or, you, you know, settle out of court. I, I can tell you the way that I normally do those when somebody does – wants to do a demand letter or something like that, or if they, you know, have a good claim, I always encourage, and this would be private clients who are actually paying me by the hourly for advice. And what I tell them always is demand letters generally do not work. And when you send a demand letter, essentially you're telegraphing what your moves are going to be. I prefer that my defendants or my targets don't even know that I'm coming. I, I like to be able to kind of cold cock them right out of the shadows, right? So what I would, you know, if you were a commercial client, private pay, what I would counsel you to do 
would be to just sewer and then talk about settlement. Yeah, that's what I was gonna do. Hit her with the uh, let the uh, you know server serve her like, hey, you're yeah. being sued. Here's your uh, notice. You have some some days to respond, and then hit her with the hey, you know, we can just squash this right here, you know. And really, my only demand is for her to make you know right of all of the claims that she made and put those back on record. I don't even really want her money. I want her to go on record that she you know falsely accused me of X, Y, and Z. And that she wants to retract that statement for the record. I mean, that holds to me more weight than any money she could give me. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can understand. Or the that, impact that she had on my case. I, I just don't think, you know, serving her with a demand letter is going to do it. Oh no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit her with the serving her with the with notice the of doing her. Okay, so you're going to sue. Her, you're going to hit her with a summons, is what you're going to do. Pretty much, that's what that's yeah, called. That's, yeah, that's that's the correct way to do it. That's that's what I normally advise. You know, paying commercial. Because obviously, if I hit her with a summons and it hits the cal court calendar, then it's obviously something that wants to be right. you know addressed. It's not you know frivolous because you know we have to go talk about it now. Right. Well, it may ultimately end up being frivolous, but that's not. That's not the issue that you're addressing right now. What you're looking at right, right now is you just don't want to do I'll, something. I'll where you're, yeah, where you're looking like extortionate. But yeah, if you just serve her with the summons and then call her up, and say, "Hey, you know, you can." How you want to act? Let's let's work it out, or you know, well, let's do that court. Right. Exactly. So that's yeah, that's mean. that's an appropriate way to deal with it. So Alyssa, one one thing that I was thinking about was, um, and I don't remember if you addressed this or not in your opposition to your your motion to dismiss, but there there is such a thing as you know delayed discovery, and particularly where the defendants you know maybe were hiding information or hiding their wrongdoing or threatened you in some way to coerce you into not pursuing your rights. So there, there are some arguments against the statute of limitations. It's just that, you know, they're 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 tough to make work unless you've got pretty good evidence. Sean, I have yeah. a question about that. Uh, who was? We had two different people talking. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. Go ahead, Marissa. That was you. Um, so I had a question on the statute of limitations. What are your thoughts with equitable estoppel where retaliation is happening now that cap has been set in place? Uh, how do you think that applies now as an opposition argument? Um, I don't know. You, you might be able to, if there's, if there's something really happening, you know, that you can show as egregious like retaliation or threats, you know, threats to threats of misconduct. If you pursue them, then you know that that might that might get you somewhere. But if there's ongoing retaliation, like right now, that's its own independent claim, and that doesn't have a statute of limitations problem because it's it's ongoing. Right. No, I I can see that one, but I mean, just like in Alyssa's case, for example, or like the Morris in those ones where we're beyond the two years and um, you're so scattered and focused on getting your kids back, I mean, due to the actions of continuing to remove your, your child, there's just so much um, disorder that's going on that you're not able to go and collect the information that you need to on preparing um, a lawsuit. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, my gut feeling is that that's not gonna fly. At least if, if an attorney were to plead it, I think it's not gonna fly. But remember the rules on pro per pleading or pro se pleading is that number one, the court's got to help you out a little bit. And number two, you get a tremendous amount of leeway and deference. So as long as you plead the elements, you might be able to make it. Right? Alyssa, I, yeah, Alyssa, I sent you over um, the opposition that we did on Morris's in case that helps you. Thank yeah, you. That's kind of what I'll yeah, talk about. I, I did, yeah, I did um, plead in the, with in my opposition. I did put in there that they the for the biggest thing was they didn't never gave me any of my case file when I requested it. 
for the longest time. I put in, I think it was four requests, which each of them, they were given 30 days to either deny my request or um, approve it and release the information, and they never did. And that's when I had to go to the ombudsman and get them to op do their investigation, which that took time. And until I contacted the ombudsman and she got me the information, I had nothing. I didn't know who did what or what, because throughout the whole time they were telling me that what they were doing was legal and right and just, and I didn't know what was what. So did you, did you, I, did you plead all of that in your complaint? Yes. Okay, yes. well... You know, that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier is the delayed discovery, right? And if part of the problem arose from defendants' own misconduct, that is, you know, suppressing the information, refusing to give you information you're entitled to under the law, stuff like that, that may satisfy the requirements, right? You need to do a little bit of research on that, but um, that may satisfy your requirements because how can you you know, know necessarily that you, you have a claim for relief until you get the info. I mean, you know something went wrong. You know, they got your kid. Absolutely. But how do you know exactly what went wrong until you get the information? And if they're hiding the information or suppressing the information so you can't get it, it seems like that would be a fairly decent argument to support, you know, your delayed discovery. I agree, and and then and that's in addition to the retaliation and all of the other things that they did throughout the entire process. Every time that I would ask a question, or I mean, even question what they were doing or what was happening, it would seem like they would do something else to kind of make me have to jump through more hoops or suffer in some type of way to so I wouldn't ask questions or I wouldn't question anything at all, and I just did what they said. Yeah, well, until it was over with. Unfortunately, that's sort of the position they get most parents into. You know, they have your kid. What are you going to do? They've got your kid, and I never even received. I never even received the affidavit that she had all the uh, the reasoning as to why they even removed my kids until the ombudsman investigated. It was never served to me. My attorney, I'm assuming he had it, but he never gave it to me. I didn't even know that there was an affidavit. Did you ask your attorney for the file? I did, yep. Oh. And he never he ne my attorney. I should have. I should. He should be included in my lawsuit because he did nothing for me. He was a warm body, essentially. Yeah, that's kind of what happens. A lot of the court appoint. I'm assuming he is court appointed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that happens with a lot of the court appointed. I always encourage everybody. You know, to the extent you can, beg, borrow, steal, donate blood, whatever it takes, get private counsel. And that's not totally fair because there, there are court-appointed court attorneys out there who are very, very good. But, um, you know, you just don't see them too often. You and far between, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just hanging in and I'm just hoping that it all works out in my favor and it doesn't get dismissed. I... I I'm going to appeal it. I, I can't just let it go. There's no way. Yeah. Well, that's Over right. three weeks, three weeks of a statute of limitations, everything that happened and everything that they did, and I'm just going to, they're going to get away with it over three weeks. Yeah, damn. And, yeah. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, it's okay. You appeal it. If it goes against you, that's, that's part of the drill. You know, we, we appeal a lot of stuff. Not everything. I was going to say we appeal everything, but that's not really fair. We don't appeal everything, but pretty much every adverse ruling or most adverse rulings, there will be an appeal that comes out of it. So there's there's nothing wrong with that. So questioner, did you have uh, any questions or anything? I, I sort of, I guess, shut you down a little bit on the comment. I apologize for that. But uh, you're on, and if you have questions, now's the time to do it. Fantastic. So um, my question is, first question is, if I file a number of complaints against, I don't know, a conservator or a court, whatever, mm -hmm. and I don't prevail, I, I, I file on my own behalf, like retaliation against me or Mm -hmm. unfair business practices, whatever. I'm filing on my own behalf. Um, 
if I don't prevail, are the facts that the court finds, if I don't prevail, are those binding on any claim that might be brought later on behalf of the conservatee? Uh, are you, what's your relationship to the conservatee? Family member. Well, I mean, aside from family member, are, are you a guardian? Are you a GAL? No, no. What, what, no, no. There's, a, there's a professional private guardian. Excuse me, professional private conservator who's abusive and neglectful. Okay. And the court's not, the court isn't, doesn't so, care. So what, so what you're going to want to look at is, and it's in state court because it's conservatorship, what you're going to want to look at is the rules on collateral estoppel and res judicata. There's five elements. I don't remember what they all are, but one of them that sounds like it may be key and crucial to your question is whether or not you are in privity with whoever it is that would come later to try to press the same claim. If you're in privity, then they will be bound by whatever the adverse ruling was. If you are not in privity, then they won't be bound by it. Does that make sense? Yes, I just have to understand more about privity. Okay, well, what privity is going to be is like, um, if your interests, if you have two parties and their interests are like, very much aligned and the one party has the ability to pursue you know like the claims on behalf of the other party then you're in a, in privity or if you're under a contract you'd be in privity if you're you know there's like a direct connection a direct relationship one one thing that happens uh and in fact this is one of the reasons that we encourage people not to have their children sue in the same lawsuit is because they are not in privity with their kids. And if they lose their lawsuit, it won't have a collateral estoppel impact on their children's claims. So we like to sever those so that, you know, if we lose on the parents, I'm screwed up there, we'll try again, retool, try again with the kids. So, I mean, that gives you kind of an example. But yeah, I would, I would do a little bit of research on collateral estoppel and particularly on, you know, privies so that you have an understanding, you know, what what type of relationship or connection is going to be required in order for the other side to apply collateral estoppel. Okay, so if the other side is saying, is already saying, you know, you should uh, go jump in a lake, you don't represent the conservatee, you have no standing, which isn't even necessarily true according to conservatorship's uh, uh -huh. case law. But if they're making statements saying you have no standing to be making these complaints, would that be helpful later to say there is um, no privity because you said I, you know, I'm only acting on my own behalf? Well, po potentially. I mean, those are arguments you would make. You would say, hey, look, you know, they said I'm, I don't have standing. Did they argue in court papers that you don't have standing? Yes. Okay, well, then that's going to be in a, a judicial admission, right? So, I mean, you're going to come back on them and say, hey, look, they argued to the court that I didn't have standing to wipe me out. So how could there be privity? Okay. Okay. That, that's the argument I would probably make. But, but again, you got to do your own research on that issue. And how would you suggest I do research on collateral estoppel and privities? I would just... Where you, what state are you in? California, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would just Google it. Say, I'll go to Google Scholar and Google collateral estoppel as one search term and then privity as another search term. Okay, and, and just see what the case law comes up. Yeah, yeah. And they're, okay. they're all, I, I don't remember the name of the case off the top of my head because I haven't had to face this issue in a really, really long time. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a case and it's got like five elements. I think it's called Lucido, L-U-C-I-D-O. In fact, I think that's that's the case. Should I knew if I sat here thinking about it long enough, I'd remember. Yeah, it's Lucido v. Superior Court, I think. So try Googling that. Okay. And if, if that doesn't if that doesn't get you where you need to be, then just Google collateral estoppel and privity. Okay. I have more questions, but sure. Okay. Um. 
Well, actually, I asked you a question last week about probate code 1851 versus um, code of federal regulations. Yeah, I, I can't answer any of that type of question because I, I don't do probate. I don't do wills and trusts. I don't do estate plan. I don't do any of that. Well, I was going to just like, um, but I was just going to, I um, I was just going to, um, I just messaged it to you. Um, it, it's actual. Um, it's, the first one where, looks where long. Where did you message it? Because I, I, don't, I don't see it. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm only sending it. Oh, uh. maybe it's, yeah, I got to get out of this thing to go look at the, put it in the chat, in the office hours chat. Uh, where's the office hours chat? Uh, I don't know. It's on the right side of my screen. Uh, okay, I, I think I just did it there, but I think that's where I put it before. Because I copied and pasted it twice now. Yeah, I don't know. Let's do this. Let's uh, mute you and you figure it out. And then we've got Starla Tech that joined in and we'll see if they've got a question. Okay, I have more questions not related to this also. Yeah, I'll come back don't. to you. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Starla Tech, you there? Hello. Well, is there a case law that says when there are issues of jurisdiction, jurisdiction can be challengeable anytime? Sorry, trying to figure this out. Okay, well, Starla Tech put her comment in the office hours chat box. I guess she's trying to figure it out. But um, to answer that question, it depends on what you're talking about in terms of jurisdiction. If you're talking about the juvenile court jurisdiction over your child, that's a different question than if you're talking about in the civil context, whether or not the court has jurisdiction over a particular defendant or a civil case. So I need more information. First time here, I just downloaded and typed slow. All right, I get it. But uh, if you can unmute yourself, that would probably make things a lot easier Then you can just talk and I can respond to it. But any, anyway, that's going to be the issue. If you're in a civil lawsuit and you're, say you're a defendant and you're claiming as a defense that the court lacks jurisdiction, whether it be personal jurisdiction or, or actually legal jurisdiction, then that's an argument that can be raised anytime, including for the first time on appeal. If you're talking about juvenile dependency court jurisdiction over the child, that would be an appealable order the jurisdictional finding, but you know, that's the only method. I mean, you have to appeal it from that order and there's strict time limitations that'll apply. And if you didn't get it done, then you're just kind of asked out. But um, yeah, that's, that's the rule. So anyway, it seems like I got that question. I'm going to put you on hold and we'll go back to, uh, questions from the gallery while you're getting things figured out. Anybody else have any other questions? I think that we've hit everybody at least once. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can you, what claims can you bring against a, like a probate court um, in federal court? You're not going to bring any claims against the court in federal court. Comedy prevents it. Also, judicial immunity prevents it. So, Not even like injunctive relief? Well, for what? It depends, on, it, it depends on the nature of the injunctive relief. If you're saying, hey, I don't like what the judge did here and join it. No, absolutely not. That's Rooker Feldman no, no. straight up. No, no. Like, like um, a policy where the court investigator goes out and meets with the conservatee and if the conservatee doesn't have capacity mm -hmm. the purpose of the investigation is to see if the conservator is acting in the best interest of the conservatee and if there are any problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they'll go talk to the conservator and then they'll talk to like the 
assisted living facility or nursing home. They'll, they'll talk to the conservator. They'll talk to people who are employed by the conservator. Uh -huh. And then they'll talk to the conservatee. If the conservatee doesn't have capacity, like they can't talk because they have dementia, uh -huh. they're the only person who isn't either the conservator or in the pay of the conservator who could say what's actually going on, but they can't because they don't have dementia. They're not going to find, they don't go out and find a family member, a friend, or somebody else, which it seems to me that the federal regulations, 28 CFR 35.160, says they have to go find a friend, oh, a family member, some, somebody some, not to pay like, the conservator. Something like that you might be able to, where you're just basically trying to get an order to make the court do something that it's required to do by statute. Okay. So it would just be straight inventive relief. Yeah. But I think that you'd get probably a quicker go of it if you did a writ just in, in state court. Because if, if, the, if the court is not complying with law, the court itself is not doing something that the statute requires, then that's, huh? some, that's something where you just file a writ, you know, to the next higher court. Okay, because it's it's a little bit confusing. I don't know if I don't know if the stuff I copied and pasted came through, because it twenty eight. Well, it did? This, this is the thing. First of all, I'll, I'll tell you all I do, all I do, literally all I do, is sue social workers under forty two U S C section nineteen eighty three for violating people's constitutional rights. That is literally the scope of my knowledge. So all this other probate stuff and federal regulations you're talking I, I have no idea i'm just kind of spitballing it right out of my butt so you went to law school and you have a lot of experience and what you're saying is very valuable from well, my perspective and if i could maybe, find somebody but maybe but don't don't treat it as as something meaningful because i'm i don't have any experience in that area and I, like See, i said i'm just spitballing it Okay, but nobody in that area is reading these two statutes together and saying, gee, the state statute says the, co the court investigator has to go out and talk to the conservatee if they have capacity and then period, end of sentence. But the federal court says it, you, a court has to ensure, quote unquote, effective communication with people with disabilities. So if somebody has a disability and they can't communicate on their own behalf, the federal court has to talk to a friend, a family, or somebody else in order yeah, to communicate effectively. Well, that, that makes sense then, that maybe you could do a uh, suit for injunctive relief, right? And maybe get a court order from the federal district court to compel the probate court to go out and do whatever it is it's supposed to do. But I, I don't know. I don't know where that's going to end up. My gut feeling is that um, I don't know, would that be like an ADA complaint? What is that? Um, well, I, th I thought it would just be injunctive relief. Yeah, but under what statute? You don't get to go in and just say, give me injunctive relief. There's got to oh. be something oh. that gets you federal jurisdiction. It's either got to be a federal statute, constitution, like what? 28 CFR 35.160. 28 Code of Federal Regulations 35.160. Okay, well, I mean... Effect communication. Then that, then that would be your basis, right? You think I could do it? I don't know. That's what I just told you. I, I don't know. Okay, okay. Yeah. So let's put this on hold because everybody else here in the group, I think they're probably got pro se complaints going on juvie stuff. And let me see if I can answer any of their questions. Anybody got anything? Yeah, I just got a general question. Uh, have you heard any, uh, have you been following this parental uh, bill of rights that they are kind of marching around the uh, legislation uh, lately? Do you think any of that verbiage will tie into something that, uh, you know, we're, we're arguing or fighting here? I don't know. I haven't been following it. I'm not actually familiar with it. So, so I, you know, they want to have parents. They want parents to have more uh, authority on what is taught to their children, like in schools, and oh, you know yeah. what you know brought in front of them. And it just kind of, you know, struck me to kind of follow along with it a little bit because it, you know said parental bill of rights. So like they might be, you know, 
you know, black and white itemizing, you know, certain rights that, you know, parents will, uh, you know, have something to stand on other than, you know, the 14th Amendment or whatnot. Well, I mean, I, I would hope I'm all for, you know, having some measure of control over what they're teaching the kids in school. I think this whole indoctrination thing is for the birds, but... You know what, what, how that materializes, and you know what comes of it. I, I don't know. I, I, I made a decision a while ago to stay out of political stuff. I'm gonna do what I can do where I can do it, and where I'm most effective is in the courtroom. So that's kind of where I focus my attention. But if they get this thing through, I mean, it sounds like a good idea. There's a lot of a lot of states arguing it, so I mean, it's. I, I'm not sure if it's already been uh, submitted. Uh, for you know vote but i just know there's a lot of controversy around it right now and uh you know that's the talk of the uh what is it the house of judicial committee or whatever it is called that uh you know are bouncing it around oh hopefully it makes it through without uh getting gutted you know that's what those politicians do they get good ideas and then fuck them all up any any other questions anybody I have one, but I'll wait for other people if. Did I say mine? Yeah, nobody else is chiming in. Go ahead. Can you raise legal issues for the first time in an appeal where the facts are undisputed? Uh, where the facts are undisputed. I think that that does happen. It seems like I've seen that where the appellate court may raise an issue sua sponte based on undisputed facts. But I think generally the rule is going to be that whatever the legal dispute is, you have to have first brought it before the trial court for resolution and given the trial judge an opportunity to resolve it, you know, one way or the other. That way the appellate court can actually look at an error. You know, re remember, you've got to have an error that was prejudicial and then resolve it. So my gut feeling without, you know, whipping out my rudder guide and looking would be no. Generally speaking, there may be instances where you can, but generally speaking, if you didn't raise it in the trial court below, you've probably uh, waived it on appeal. Where do you think I can get um, templates or examples of injunctive relief oh, claims shit. against uh, probate um, court based on 28 CFR 160, 35.160. I would Google it. Okay. I would just, if it, if I were doing it and somebody were paying me to do it, the first place I would go would be Google Scholar. Okay. Well, that's not totally true because I have a lot of resources you guys don't have. I've got like a very robust Lexus account. I've got Westlaw, so I'd probably go to the practice guides in, uh, Westlaw first. I'd probably go to the rudder guides and see if there's anything in there. And then I would maybe go look at Matthew Bender, see if there's anything in there. What's Google Scholar all about? Uh, Google Scholar is actually pretty cool. There's all sorts of research, research articles. There's cases. All the cases are there. It's, you know, it's actually really cool. Let me see how you get there. I haven't used it in a long time. But, um, Let's see here. Uh, Google. Okay. Yeah, if you just go, just type in Google Scholar on your taskbar, and then when it comes up, it gets you there, and you can look at books, research articles, research topics, citations, all kinds of crap. So just in your in your taskbar, you know, type Google Scholar, it'll take you right there. There's all kinds of stuff you can research there. But I know that people use it for legal research. I've used it for legal research before. And it's it's actually pretty good. And it's okay. free. That's the big thing. It's it's totally free and it's actually pretty good. All right, well, if nobody else has any 
questions, I think we're going to cut it. We've been going about an hour, and I got the live going on at 6.30, so I'm going to take a little break and grab something to eat real quick, go pee, all that kind of stuff. TMI. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little too much. Yeah. <laughs> all right. It's good to be back. I'll uh, see you guys next week, and uh, appreciate it as always. Sounds good, man. Glad to have you back. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you guys for Catch checking in. Catch you guys in. on live. Yep, we'll see you on live. Thank you all for coming in tonight. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.